essentially what we're all about. Uh, it's closing the loop for two specific types of plastic. Uh, and they are the two plastics most commonly used for bottles. So you have PET, used for drinks, uh, water, carbonated beverages, and uh, type two, high density polyethylene, HDPE, used for milk bottles. Plastics has been, have been being recycled for quite a while, but often they end up what some people call downcycling. So that's a typical product that's made from milk. Uh, it's a timber replacement product made by a company up in Liverpool called Centraforce, um, used for decking, garden furniture, so on and so forth. Nothing wrong with that, unless perhaps you're a forest owner and you're trying to sell timber to do that job. But the issue is, once you've converted a milk bottle into this, you can never convert this back into a milk bottle, or at least not a milk bottle that the market will accept. So you've uh, effectively taken the opportunity to reuse that material back at the highest level. At the moment, we reckon we've got a bottle recycling rate of around about 52%. So still, roughly one in two plastic bottles is going to landfill. Uh, the milk bottle recycling rate is uh, quite a bit higher at 72%. Um, no one's 100% certain why that is. But the general consensus is that's because most milk bottles end their life in the kitchen, and that's where the recycling bin tends to be. We find that bottles often struggle, particularly to make their way down from the bathroom, and certainly a lot of PET products are consumed when you're out and about, and on-the-go recycling collection is very, very patchy. But we're set to see almost a doubling in the recycling collection rate by 2017, so we've got about five years to collect twice as much plastic as we currently are. Bottles arrive to us, compacted into large bales, lots of different types of bales. We start by running them through some dry cleaning processes, so we've got to undo those bales, and we've got to remove the gross contaminants. A lot of recyclables are collected co-mingled, meaning one bin, newspapers, magazines, cans, glass, textiles, all sorts of bits and pieces, and we find those items in our incoming material. So in fact, almost before we've begun, anything up to 20% of what comes through our gate isn't a plastic bottle already uh, and we simply have to get, remove that before we can even get down to the business of sorting the plastics. Once we've removed the gross contamination we then sort the plastics first by plastic type then by plastic colour. We do that primarily with optical sorters, machine sorters and then we uh, polish that sort with people actually picking through. Then we shred the bottles uh, which facilitates the washing process but also begins the, 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 the very important step of, obviously if that comes into us, what we're seeking to recycle is just the bottle. So we've got to remove the label, which, uh, yeah, there we go, it's pretty easy, until you get to there. We've got to remove the adhesive. Uh, we've got to remove the cap, the bottle's capped. Even if you've taken the cap off, most PET bottles will still have the closure ring, which doesn't come off. Uh, before we can begin the super cleaning process. Likewise for milk bottles, cap, label, all got to come up. Uh, so after we've shredded, we have various wash systems, uh, air washing, elutriation, where we remove light label fragments from heavy bottle fragments, friction hot wash, where we use a mild caustic solution that takes care of glues, uh, residual liquid, and then density separation. Because as I said, the legislation around food grade plastics are very tight, uh, so we have to check every single batch to make sure the purification process has been successful. So this is a cutaway diagram of an optical sorter. Um, this is the sort of the meat and bones of the sorting system. You've got a mixture of materials whizzing along a conveyor. They pass under a sensor. The sensor we use is a sort of near-infrared camera system. Uh, the reason we use near-infrared is that different types of polymer and different coloured objects absorb, <laughs> transmit, reflect, very different amounts of near-infrared or, or energy in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum. So the camera is actually able to distinguish between a PET bottle and an HDP bottle. Uh, it's able to distinguish between a natural HDP milk bottle and a blue Domestos bottle. This is the first point where packaging design starts to impact on the recyclability of a product. Uh, Lucozade bottles are often sleeved completely. So the Lucozade bottle itself is beautiful, clear PET, perfect for the recycling process, but they've shrunk wrap it in a polypropylene sleeve that's bright orange. So unless you have very good camera systems, um, it's very easy to mistake that bottle for an orange bottle or a polypropylene bottle. So we do a lot of work around how we can get around that. We, you can do things with more sophisticated sensors, which we have done. Then you start pushing back towards the product designers and say, 
well, can you make sleeves that, for example, have windows in them? Because if the system can see even a small quantity of PET, we can program it to recognise that that's a bottle with a sleeve. Um, or could we add something to the sleeve that makes it machine detectable? And then once the sensor's made its decision, as the bottles drop off the end of the conveyor belt, air jets can sort them down multiple different chutes. So this is showing sort of PET here, HDPE, everything else here. Imagine the same system but saying I want all the clear and light blue bottles, all the coloured bottles, and perhaps uh, a, a secondary check for something like PVC. So optical sorters, fantastic, um, and they do the work of, of lots and lots of people. But we can't rely on machines at all, not least because optical sorters at best are 95% effective. The manual sorters also do something very important, which is that another huge challenge from a design perspective, which is um, illustrated here. So I've got two bottles here that I've picked off from down the line. Uh, that's a four-pint milk bottle. That's a flash Febreze fabric, all-purpose cleaner. Both of those bottles are HDPE. Both of them are uncolored, what we, what we term natural. Unfortunately, to a near-infrared sensor, they look like the same bottle. It's the right plastic, it's the right color, or the right lack of color. But, from a legal point of view, I can convert that back into food grade material. I can't convert that back into food grade material, at least not legally. So a huge job for my manual sorters is once the machines have got a big pile of these color, is to identify these and take them out. And so there's all sorts of interesting ideas flying around at the moment about how we might make machines that can tell the difference between those two objects. Increasingly, particularly for fruit and smoothie products and alcohol and other things that are starting to be packaged in PET, in order to extend shelf life, instead of just using a homopolymer bottle, there might be layers of nylon or, or other substances that provide oxygen barrier properties or so on and so forth. But we need to be able to identify flakes that have those barrier additives in them because, again, we're supplying what is in effect a virgin, pure plastic product. Yeah, so these systems can remove metal, coloured flakes, other plastics, other materials. So this is uh, sorting coloured PET flakes. Oh, tremendous. So <laughs> there's one gone. So it's actually removing pretty good. It, you, you'll notice, though, that one bad flake costs us three or four good flakes at least. So we try to remove as many bad objects, let's, for example, green PET bottles, um, before we get to the flake stage, because it's very lossy, two, three hundred percent loss. Uh, you know, go to some markets and 7-Up and Sprite are in clear plastic yeah. to facilitate recycling. But, you know, this is a commercial world. You understand yeah. the need for them to differentiate their product on the shelves. It's been green for years and years and years. I mean, interestingly, if we had enough green, I could actually produce a food grade green plastic. Now they couldn't use that to make new green bottles because the colour balance would go out. Right. Um, you know, the manufacturers know to the picogram how much green you add to a ton of clear plastic to make a nice consistent green bottle. But a food grade coloured RPET flake or pellet could easily be used for black PET food trays. Yeah, sure. So um, it, it's something that we're looking at. And uh, again, if we ever had enough, we could invest in the equipment to do it. And then after all the washing and the flake sorting, we just have the purification processes. Uh, lots of science involved there, um, but two different plastics, two different processes. There are a number of different systems on the market for PET. We happen to use one called UWRC Hybrid Unpet. Uh, it's a non-melt process, meaning we start with a flake and we finish with a clean flake. Uh, by not melting the PET, we actually preserve the color and the intrinsic viscosity of the plastic. HDPE, very similar to polypropylene, belongs to a group of plastics called polyolefins. They're uh, particularly soft and quite porous, particularly to organic compounds, volatile organics. Uh, in fact, you know, if you, if you pick up a bottle of Febreze, even if it's sealed, you can smell through it because the various volatile organics, the essential oils that have been used to make it smell of chamomile strewn mountain valleys. Um, has, has saturated itself into the plastic. Now, when we super clean this material, we're using high temperature, low pressure. So we're holding the shredded flakes in a reaction vessel uh, at around about 117 degrees centigrade under quite a hard vacuum for at least 90 minutes. And that's drawing out the volatiles 
which then get removed in an air scrub system. So uh, the last thing that we want is for our milk bottle pellets to have any trace of, of essential oils left in them. Limonene is the worst. Everything is lemon fresh because that would quite conceivably migrate back into whatever that bottle was used to make. We must control our input to the pelletizing process to be 99% or more items that have previously been used in a food contact application. So we have we have to do hourly sampling, where we you know take a hundred bottles and make sure that only one is um, a non-milk bottle. Ideally, we want none. These, once they're identified, uh, are combined with the coloured HDP bottles, which we've already said, Demesos, Jif and so on and so forth, rebaled and sold for other recycling processes. So this sort of stuff is now being made from all the coloured bottles, which upsets them, interestingly, because when you start with all the colours, you're pretty much left, you can only go to brown, black, so on and so forth. So if you want nice, brightly coloured recycled plastic furniture, pinks, yellow, so on and so forth, you're back needing milk bottle plates. So. All right, sorry, the PRN, if you don't know, is packaging recovery note. When you recycle something, um, you can generate PRN. So for every tonne of plastic I reprocess, or we reprocess, we can generate one PRN, which is valid for one tonne of plastic. If you put plastic into the market, if you're a supermarket, you're a retailer, or you're a brand owner, above a certain production volume, you have to offset by buying PRN. So if you put 10 tonnes of plastic bottles onto the market, you need to buy 10 PRNs. Now, 18 months ago, the value of that PRN was two pounds a tonne. 10 tonnes of bottles is a lot of bottles, and it would have cost you 20 quid. Now, today's prices, they've hit 30, 40 pounds a tonne. There's enormous variability. It's still not a massive amount. But um, in, uh, Belgium, for example, under the FOSS Plus variant of, uh, of, of Green Dot, uh, it's not £2 a tonne, it's more like £60 a tonne. In Germany, it's nearly €100 Euros a tonne to put, you know, you have to pay. And that money is earmarked to go towards building and developing collection and recycling infrastructure. And I remember so when, when, I was, when I was at Asda, they bought all the parents yeah. for year one, and the, for month one, day one, quarter one, yeah. and the prices are up here. Yeah. By the end of the year, they'd fallen, and it was a, it was a big financial loss. It, yeah. it might be little, but it, over yeah. a big business, it makes a massive yeah, yeah, yeah. So M and S ended up investing directly in collection infrastructure. Um, and they bought the PRNs as well, credit to them, because they had to, it's the legal yeah. responsibility. But big brands and retailers want to do this, it seems, because they see the value in the perception on their customer base that they're trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm.